Today, I'm really pleased to introduce you to Todd Stoner. Uh, Todd is the uh, person who started a group here in town called Discipline, Invest Discipline Investors. Uh, Todd is a Baylor grad. He also has an MBA from Cornell. He's worked in industry. He's done a lot of financial planning. He's done lots of different things. But in 1998, he started this uh, firm here at Waco. <laughs> Um, I've had the privilege of knowing Todd since uh, 2001. Uh, Todd and I are uh, members of the same church, and our kids have grown up together, and lots of things like that. Plus, Todd is the person who has managed um, Brenda's and my financial stuff for 10, 12 years, or something like that, for quite a bit of time. So I work with Todd often. Uh, those of you who've been in the leadership class know that we talk about financial matters, and we talk about saving for retirement, and what does that look like, and why is it important, and um, we spend some time on that subject. So Todd's going to give you, mine is the layperson perspective, and Todd will give you a, a professional perspective about this today. But this could go down in your life as one of the most important uh, 50 minutes that you've spent. So uh, just my idea here. Todd, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank I'm you. Really glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I was here about 35 years ago around these halls uh, and around this campus. So it's neat to come back. I also taught at Baylor in the economics department for a couple of years when I was transitioning into the investment management business. Our firm has five people here. We manage about $250 million in assets for either individuals or company retirement plans. And so the first part of the presentation here is what we do when we go to a company and we may have a, a room full of bankers or manufacturing people. And we try to talk to them about getting ready to retire. And so we've got some slides for that. Uh, but please, any questions, comments, I'd love to hear them. Uh, you have a lot of questions at the end, but during the talk here, that'd be great too. So uh, thank you. Um, first of all, when we talk to people, we just say, you know, usually thinking about retirement is, you know, thinking about getting old, it's like up there with death and taxes. Most people don't <laughs> want to think about what they need to do. Saving money doesn't sound like much fun. And so what we try to do is, is frame it and say, well, Think of what you could do if you were retired and you had done a good job preparing for retirement. You know, maybe you, you're riding a Harley around the country or you're sailing or spending time with your grandkids. You know, it makes a huge difference if you prepared well. Um, you know, that I may offend people now and then by saying, you know, you don't want to have to go back and be a greeter at Walmart, you know, when you're 70 years old because your money's running out and you need to do something. You want to prepare well for it. So, Hopefully this will help you start thinking about that, even though it probably seems like a really long time away. Um, they say if you will uh, picture yourself as a retired person, that that actually helps you make better decisions for retirement. And there's even phone apps where you can age yourself. I think there's one called Ageify or something like that. It shows you what you might look like. You, you might have fun doing that for yourself or some friends. And think about, well, what would you do now to prepare and help that person, you know, 70-year-old you, 75-year-old you, have a better life? You know, would you be willing to cut back a little on your spending so you could save more? Uh, really, how much you save is the most important thing in all, it, more so than how you actually invest. You know, did you start saving early? Um, but you know, think about you, you may be a widower or a widow, you know, in the future. You know, what would you do so that you have flexibility to travel and see grandkids or or not have to work if your health was starting to go downhill? So so just think about that, maybe try that phone app. Um, the goal when you retire, you probably need somewhere between seventy and hundred percent of your income from when you're working to live on when you're retired. It kind of depends what your lifestyle wants to be. Some people, when they retire, want to be real active and travel. They've got this big bucket list of things they want to do. Others more are just going to settle down, relax, you know, maybe get books from the library, read, you know, hang out, do some volunteering. So if you're, you know, if you're not going to travel and spend quite as much, maybe you can get by on 70% of your working income. But if you, you know, really want to do some traveling, uh, Maybe you're spending more money. Some people have a, a trouble when they retire because they're spending money because instead of being in, at work, they've got time to shop <laughs> and all. 
or spend money. So in that case, you may need to totally replace your salary from when you're working. How long do you all think you'll live? <laughs> Great question. 85? 70s? 100? 100? Okay. No, no, no. 102. Y'all are ambitious. Well, this is the next slide. Yeah. Somebody, somebody said, I have another 10 years. What's going on there? But this slide shows. For people 65, how long they're likely to live. So this is, you know, statistically the odds. And if you look here, like uh, the blue bar is a woman, the gray is a man, and the green is for a couple. So if you have a couple, there's that odd of one or both of you living that long. And so, you know, 85 here, somebody said, a woman's got 54% chance to live to be 85, a man 42, and if you're part of a couple, a 74% chance that at least one of you will live to be 85. And if you look at like 90, 33% for women, 22% for men, and 47% for a couple. So you have about a 50-50 chance that one of you lives to be 90. And even 95, the odds are not bad, you know, 19% for a couple. Uh, and then, you know, that may go up in the future, obviously, with better health care and things like that. So this is sort of a scary straight slide to get you thinking, you know, when you retire, let's say at 65 or 70, whenever it is, you can't think of that I need to have like 10 years worth of savings or 15 years worth of savings. If you retire at 65, you may live 30 more years. So that is a long time for you to have to scrimp and save if you have not, you know, done a good job up to that point. So that's sort of, like I said, sort of scare you straight, hopefully gets you doing things now that might take care of you in the future. How many people think Social Security is mostly what they need to live on in retirement? That's what I thought. What's that? That's what I thought. That's what you Okay. Does everybody think Social Security is going to be there when you're retiring? No. 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 <laughs> so there, there is that skepticism. Uh, I think it'll be there in some form, but there's a good chance they're going to have to change it to make it pay out less, just so it doesn't go belly up. So right now is probably the best so the Social Security system will ever be, you know, going forward. And right now, if you're making thirty thousand a year. Social Security will cover just 45% of your income when you retire. And the higher your income, the less Social Security covers. It's a progressive system, so if you're making 60000 a year, Social Security covers about 38%. So you have to figure out, well, where's that other 55% going to come from, or 50% or 60%? And the point is, uh, you know, it's really your responsibility to do that. No one's going to do that for you. Unfortunately, does anybody here have a pension as they worked and have a pension? Or maybe your parents have a pension? It used to be if you worked at General Motors or something like that, when you were 60 years old, you could get a pension and keep basically drawing your salary for the rest of your life, which was a sweet deal, but a lot of those companies got in trouble because they promised too much. So now the numbers of people with pensions is pretty low. Usually they're super large corporations, and even those have cut back, you know, or if you work for like the city or state. So pensions probably won't be there for you. So you, again, I say, have to figure out, well, where's that money going to come from? Uh, Fidelity Mutual Fund gives these numbers here and says, this is kind of a goal you should have for trying to save. So these numbers are a factor times your salary that you should have saved at different stages of your life. So here at age 25, they assume you haven't saved anything. So you're not behind then, most of you. <laughs> but like at age 35, they think you should have between one and one and a half times your salary saved for retirement. And you go all the way down here, when you retire, you should have eight to 12 times your salary saved for retirement. So if your salary is $100,000, you should have $800,000 or $1.2 to $1.2 million in a retirement savings account, a retirement account of some sort. 
So again, these are big numbers. Maybe that's a little scary too. Um, does that seem like a lot? Here, here's the good, the good. Here's the good news, and it's the power of compounding. So, here we have Michael and Bob. Michael started saving $100 a month at age 25. You can see how happy he is. So, <laughs> for 40 years, he saved 100 bucks a month, $48,000. But with investment returns of 8% a year, that turns right. into 324,000. So, $100 a month turns into 324,000. You can see Bob here has a, a migraine headache. He, he didn't start saving until he was 45. But he thought, I'm going to catch up by saving $300 a month. So he actually saved $72,000, but because his money didn't have time to grow as long, it only turned into $172,000. So he had a little over half of what Michael had, even though he saved three times as much, but for only the last 20 years of his career. So again, good news for y'all is this is, you're early, you can do this. And you know, maybe it's not 100 bucks a month, maybe you can save two or 300 bucks a month. And then, you know, 300 bucks a month gets you pretty close to that million dollar range. Sometimes we do these education meetings with the companies and you'll have like a 55 or 60 year old person and they'll be like, well, I've only got about $20,000 saved because, you know, I've changed jobs and I've cashed out my retirement plan. What should I do? And you know, we always feel really badly for them and we say, well, Plan to work as long as you can. You know, don't definitely don't plan to retire at 65 or 67. You need to work till 70, maybe 75. You know, instead of saving 10 or 15 percent, you need to try to save like 30 percent or more. And even then, you're never going to catch up, but you can do a lot. But for y'all, you're in good shape that you can be some of these early savers that really make a big difference. So that's sort of the end of what we do sort of to help people motivate them to save, you know, more when they're in the, like a company retirement plan. Any questions so far on any of these things? Okay. Um, so now I'm going to just talk about some things about investing. And some of you all may know some of this, some of you may not. But generally one of the big ideas of investing is there's return and there's risk. And you have to kind of trade off the one for the other. And so you have to decide, well, how am I going to invest? How much risk am I willing to take? And so this sort of just shows you a spectrum of going from the super safe, highly, highly liquid, so you can get the money just immediately, assets, all the way to very risky assets, or, or more risky assets. It all depends what proportions you have in it. So you've got like checking accounts, you know, earning almost nothing, but you can get the money. <coughs> Savings accounts, again, very safe, but, you know, not earning much. Then you could get into bonds. Uh, I don't know if you all know what bonds are. Bonds are when a company or like a municipality or state government <coughs> says, well, if you give us $1,000, we'll pay you $50 a year for the next five years, and then we'll give you your $1,000 back. So you're getting a fixed amount back. There's sort of a cap, but it's also pretty safe, you know. At the end of five years, unless there's been some trouble, you're going to get your money back. So those tend to be a little higher return, a little higher risk. You can have interest rates change and those things drop in value. You may have like preferred stocks and junk bonds, a little more risk, a little higher return. And then your highest risk areas are generally like your stock funds. You could have you know, blue chip large company stocks are risky, but not as risky as foreign stocks or small cap stocks. So that's sort of the spectrum you can have. And for most people, you want to kind of have a few things along here. You don't want to be all in one or another area. And the general <coughs> idea is the younger you are, the more risk you can take. You know, if you're 25 years old and have $2,000 saved, if it drops in value by 25%, it's not going to really kill your final you know, amount you've got saved for retirement. So you can take the risk knowing that the market's going to have ups and downs, bear markets where it drops 20%, and bull markets where it comes back. But over the long term, you should do better. Um, small cap stocks have done about 11% a year <coughs> over the last 90 years. Large cap stocks have done about 10 So you get about a 1% to 2% better return than small companies. 
bonds have made, you know, five or six percent. The difference between five and six percent for like a 20 year period at 10 percent return is humongous. So that's where when you're young, you should probably be taking risk. And when, you old, when you're older, you start moving down and you get more of your assets <coughs> into safer accounts or safer types of assets. Any questions on that? Anybody did dabble in stocks or anything? Yeah. Uh, where where would uh, shares be at? Because I have like a, a rough IRA. Okay. I'm doing like, I, mean, I don't really have that much, but um, I'm like kind of loosely following what Dave Ramsey talked about. Okay. And whenever I get up to 2,500, uh, I think I remember at least from what my mentor was telling me about going into getting like a, a share, mm -hmm. like a, like just a, like just one that's either like 2500 but okay where would something like that lay on yeah. here well shares can either mean like individual company shares or you can have shares in mutual funds but my guess yeah, is you're that's... probably in some of these like stock mutual funds maybe mm -hmm. um, so within lots of different accounts you can have these different investments and yeah. common stocks or stocks you know are the higher risk ones you have shares in the company or uh, if you have bonds, they're just called bonds. You don't have shares in the bond, and then bank accounts. So. Cool. Okay. Yeah. But some people, you know, have already dabbled in this a little bit. When the market's going up a lot, I'll have more students come to me afterwards and say, hey, I've got a little bit of money in Bitcoin or something like that, you know. So, uh, and, and we usually say, you know, you can play around with some things like that, but overall, your main money should be probably safer if the asset companies. Um, so the biggest decision you have to make, the most important decision as far as your investments go, is what's my asset allocation going to be? How much is in those riskier assets versus the safer assets? And like if you are part of a company that, or somebody that has a retirement plan or maybe a church that has a retirement plan, that's a decision. There'll be like a questionnaire you fill out and it might ask you questions like, if you bought a stock or a mutual fund and it dropped 30% in value, what would you do? Would you sell it immediately and not take any more losses? Would you hold on? Would you try to buy more? <coughs> and the more you're able to take the ups and downs, the more risk you're probably comfortable with. And then also is also determined by, you know, do you plan to retire in 10 years, 15, 30 years, 40 years? Because the longer you have, again, the more risk you can take. And also, do you have anything else going on? Do you have a family farm or something like that? There are lots of individual circumstances that might let you take more risk. But the studies show, like some say, show as much as 96% of your return depends on that asset allocation decision, more so than did I pick this fund or that fund or this individual stock or that one. Because over the long term, those are kind of average out. So this is where. Like if you spend time, try to read you know, up on this and try to make a good decision that fits you on the asset allocation. And part of it is you want to diversify. Don't put it all your eggs in one basket. You know, diversification with investments just means that you've got some big companies and some small companies, some foreign, some US, some bonds, some high quality bonds, low quality bonds. All those things will kind of make it so that when you're, if a certain part of the market does really poorly, you don't get hurt too badly. But if another part of the market does well, you've got some money in that too. So you want to diversify and diversify across asset categories like stocks and bonds. Um, kind of what, one thing that's sort of confusing for a lot of people is so you have the types of investments and then you also have the investment accounts you can use. And this slide may be one of the more difficult, probably the most difficult one for the thing here, but I just want to break out. Here's some different types of investments. You have uh, or investment accounts. You have accounts at banks and credit unions, uh, brokerage accounts, company or organization retirement accounts, and then insurance company accounts. And you can have some of these investments in several of these. The simplest is probably the banks and the credit unions. That's more like a savings account or a CD, a certificate of deposit, where maybe you're given the bank money and two years later you get your money back plus interest. So that's really pretty low risk. But you can even have 
like an individual retirement account in a CD at a bank. So the individual retirement account can be in all these. Uh, the brokerage account is probably what a lot of people think. And that's when you just open an account with Schwab or Fidelity or TD Ameritrade or E-Trade. And in that account, you can buy any sorts of mutual funds. You can buy, buy individual companies. Um, you can have both taxable money or retirement money in an individual retirement account or IRA. Um, is anybody working for somebody with a company retirement account or organization account, retirement account? You know, Magnolia workers here or anything like that. <laughs> we actually manage or we advise on the Magnolia plan. So there are a lot of young people that work there. Um, so if you work for a plan, a company with a plan, that's a big help to you. Because if you work there, they'll do automatic payroll deductions for you. So you just have to say, I want to put 2% of my money into the plan. And then they may match it, which is a really nice thing, where they say, if you put in 2%, we'll put in 2%. And so when you are interviewing, you should definitely be asking people, do you have a, any kind of retirement account that I have access to? If you do, is it a match? Or is there any kind of contributions made by the employer or me? <coughs> Uh, Baylor has a very nice deal. If you work at, a, at Baylor, Baylor puts in 10.8% of your salary automatically. It's not even a match. They put it in no matter what you do. So if, you're, if you've, we've had lots of Baylor people who've been here for 40 years and they are doing quite well when they retire because of that 10.8%. With a 401k, if you leave your company, doesn't it go away or no? Um, no. Sometimes the company's contribution for you can get eliminated. That's called vesting. And every plan is different. Some you immediately keep all the money the company's put in for you. And some you have to wait like three years and you keep 20%. Four years you keep 40% and it goes up. But always the money you put in would always be still yours. But the company or, or organization's money, they, they want to encourage you to stay around. A lot of times they put that rule in. Um, the uh, uh, usually, if you leave, you can either leave it in the plan, or you could like roll it into an IRA if you wanted to, and then you just have an individual retirement account. Yeah. So, like, how do you have access to that money if it is with like a company that you aren't working with? Anymore? Well, usually you would contact either the company or there might be a plan administrator called that you could call and you could say, I want to roll my money out of the plan. And they would send you a form to do that. And you have to set up another account somewhere to roll it into. So like we usually use Charles Schwab for most of our individual accounts. So we can <coughs> help a person set up an individual retirement account, give them that account number they would fill out. Usually it's only a one or two page form that says send my balance. I'm no longer employed here, send the balance of my account over to my IRA, and they send it. And then once it's in the IRA account, you can manage it yourself. Or if you go from one company plan to another, <coughs> to another company organization has a plan, you can say, well, usually I want to transfer my money from my old employer to my new employer's plan and keep it. One of the biggest mistakes people make is that, you know, let's say they have $5,000 in a company or a retirement plan account and they leave and they go somewhere else. That money's just very easy to get to. There may be some expenses related to switching jobs or whatever. And people cash out, they pay a 10% penalty, plus it's taxable income. Mm -hmm. So you may end up paying like 25, 35% of it and you don't get to keep that. And you think, well, it's only $5,000, but you might pay easily $1,000 or $1,500 of that in taxes or penalties. And that $5,000 could have grown if, if you had left it invested for you know, 30 years. That could have turned into $50,000. So if you can, really try not to cash out your accounts, even though that's really common. So these, these types of finance, they're called like 401k plans if you're in a like a company or a 403B plan if you work for a nonprofit, a hospital, a university. Like I said, they're really good with the matches. Um, uh, you can save in pre-tax or Roth, and we'll talk about that in, in a second. Um, there's also some other smaller plans that you don't hear about as much, like a SIP IRA or a simple plan. 
But the 401k and 43b are, I think about 70% of people will work for an organization that has one of those. So it's pretty likely that you're going to get that at some point and have that option to be in there. So, any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, you know, Godstone is a name that's familiar with uh -huh. church you know, organizations. Uh, and so I'm wondering, is the kind of, like a church that sets up a retirement account within Godstone, is that similar to what a 401k? Yeah, it's actually the 403b. It's 403b. So 403b is usually for a nonprofit or like a school or, uh -huh. or hospital. Uh, Guidestone, I'm definitely familiar with them because they're one of the Baylor uh, 403B okay. administrators. Um, and they're you know, a very large company. And a lot of churches, like at our church, our pastors over the last uh, 25 years have chosen two or three different places for their retirement money to go. And Guidestone's been one of the more common ones. There's some other ones too. But uh, one nice thing, if you're a minister, it, as of now, the law is that you can save money and someday use it as a minister's housing allowance in retirement. And that is, has some nice tax advantages, although uh, some of the ministers I know think that that may go away you know, in the next 20 years. So hopefully it doesn't, but it's, it's a nice way to do it. To do that, you have to save through somebody like Guidestone in most cases, somebody who works with churches and they have to sort of have a, uh, the documentation that allows that. Does that give you the free, you know, for the turnover that you see in between churches? You know, just going between different churches and religious organizations, does that mm -hmm. kind of free you up to kind of keep your retirement no matter where you are? Yeah, place? usually I think you could keep it at Guidestone, and you may go from one church to another, and both of the churches could contribute to the same Guidestone account. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure, but you could talk to Guidestone. I know we've got some professors here who have, you know, they were three different universities, so they have three different accounts. But they could roll them all into the Baylor plan. And then they may have like a church plan uh, for the as well, if they work like as an interim pastor or something like that. But the church plan does all go into the same one when you switch churches. Yeah. Yeah, so good questions. Uh, the third, the fourth one here, I just thought I'd put down insurance companies. And usually if you invest within the insurance company, you're buying an annuity. And I just would say it's usually bad. <laughs> I mean, uh, usually they're expensive or, or they have big fees or big surrender charges. So, I mean, they cannot, there are some cases where it's not bad, but generally if, if somebody is, is trying to get you to buy an annuity, be pretty careful and find out what all the expenses are. I just dealt with a, a work with a client today and he had an annuity he bought. And normally the expenses you can keep, let's say they're like a half a percent a year for the expense of the investments. And his was 2.1%. And I've seen some as high as 3% with the annuities. And those may have some special you know, features to them where it says we're gonna give you a guaranteed rate or we're gonna guarantee you're not gonna lose money. But overall, they're usually not a very good deal. So be wary of, of and annuities overall. The commissions on the annuities, we had one lady whose husband passed away from Baylor and, and an insurance person convinced her to sell his retirement account and the, co the commission on what uh, she moved with him was 7%. Mm -hmm. So she moved that 500000 in and he made $35,000 from that one sale. So it shows how, mm -hmm. how big a sales commission there can be on annuities. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then, what other decision you have to make, like if you're in a 403B plan, you can save in pre-tax form or in Roth form. If you save as pre-tax, you get a tax savings up front, which is nice, but the Roth is probably better for most of you younger people, because you've got money that you will, you know, if I save $1,000 now, hopefully it turns into $20,000 when I retire. I'd rather pay taxes on $1,000 now instead of 20000 in the future. So that's something to talk to people about. But think about the Roth as your main you know, investment uh, type. <coughs> and do you know who these people are? Anybody know them? Warren Buffett. Oh, Angry. Yeah. 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 Y
So this is just, yeah, Jim Clay Murray's got mad money, yeah. And so oh, this yeah, is just a right. slide. You know, some people think about investing like buying and selling and trading, and I'm going to make money selling this and buying this and then selling it and buying something else. Warren Buffett's attitude is long term. He says, I'd love to be able to go into it. You know, have, be in a coma for five years and know that my companies are still doing well. So he invests in companies like Coca-Cola and Apple and Burlington Northern Railroad. You know, so that's more of what most people should do. The buying and selling is really difficult. And just a quick little video here. This talks about the. Sometimes, as investors, we uh, are tempted to follow the herd. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff, will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> his individuality, but little by little, <laughs> he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And, uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> 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 now, here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. Now <laughs> 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 see if we can use. Now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie Signal, everybody turns forward. <laughs> there, notice. They take off their hats. <laughs> and now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. <laughs> that is about how, in investing, there's always a, a temptation to go with what everybody's talking about. So if, if people are talking about Bitcoin and think that that's a great thing, you know, or, uh, you know, people make money in tech stocks, you know, just be careful about that. You know, usually if you've heard about it, it's probably past, you know, when it, the time to get in good. My mother got married when she was 17 uh, years old. We had a lot of people who, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a, in the last year we had about 10 of our clients call us and say, what about marijuana stocks? That seems to be the big one now. People that want to invest in marijuana stocks. Most of them are in Canada where it's legal. But, you know, that's been one. There's been a lot of, you know, they've gone up, you know, 100% and down 30%. And so it's been exciting. And so a lot of people want to think about that. But there's all these, these manias. And what we say is it's sort of like a roller coaster. You know, you, you're going up, it's thrilling, you're so excited. And then it turns and you go from, you know, denial, despair, panic, you know, sell it. And what people tend to do is they get excited and buy here and then they sell here because they're so worried. And that's, you know, is that the strategy to make money, buy high and sell low? No. So, so really try to keep more even. Our company's named Discipline Investors. We try to stay, you know, always invest. Don't, you know, let your emotions cause you to go through too many you know, roller coaster cycles if you can help it. And then my last slide here is just some things to think about investing through the ages, things you should do at different ages. And so in your 25 to 35 years, uh, 
you know, try to pay off all your consumer debt, don't have any credit card debt, uh, start an emergency fund. That's a Dave Ramsey idea, you know, that have some money so that if you have a big car expense or household expense, you don't have to put it on a credit card that you can't pay off. You've got money uh, in an emergency fund. Uh, contribute to your, your 401k or 403b at least as much to get the match, if there's a match, um, at your company. Every time you get a raise, try to think about, I'm going to put part of my raise into the company or retirement plan I have, and I'm going to keep part of it. And if you can, do a Roth IRA just individually. That way you have control of it, you can invest in that. It's a good time to do a Roth when you're early in your career, probably not making as high a salary as you do later. Then from 36 to 50, you really try to get your retirement savings up to 10 to 15% a year. If you can average about 15%, you should be able to retire in really good shape and be able to live in retirement at the same standard of living you had when you were working. Uh, you might have college savings you need to worry about doing. <coughs> and then towards the end of your career, try to pay off all your debt, including your mortgage. It makes a huge difference if you go into retirement with a mortgage versus no mortgage. And you know, especially if you're behind, really try to get your savings up to 15 to 20%. Because you can catch up, maybe your expenses have dropped because your kids are gone, things like that. And that's when you can really put a lot away uh, and then start planning for retirement. So, any other questions here? Yeah. Um, this is a practical guide for somebody who, you know, doesn't have a lot of money but wants to start investing and, um, you know, has enough money to invest but maybe. An, too much to just be sitting around and savings account. You know? yeah. So what are some practical ways to start out? Should we you know, open up an E-Trade account? Should we seek a financial advisor advice? Like what's the best way to start? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say all the big ones, E-Trade, Fidelity, Schwab, you, you know, Merrill Lynch Direct, there are lots of online accounts you can set up. They're very low cost. You know, maybe they have like a $20 annual fee or something like that, but hopefully no fee. Those are all good. And then probably what I would start with is just like getting like a total stock market index fund. And that gives you just broad exposure to the whole US stock market. And then maybe get an international index fund that covers foreign stocks. And those are just real simple things you can do and pick them out on your own. If you look at, uh, it's hard to see here, Morningstar is a good source for information. You can do a little research on it. But those index funds keep the cost really low. And you know, especially if you're just starting with a thousand or two two thousand dollars, you can put it in there and know that you're going to have volatility, but your returns are probably going to be positive over time, and may actually be quite good if you can, you know, like the last nine years have been you know, exceptionally good in investments after we have a big decline. So, yeah, those are all good ones, and uh, usually you can set up automatic bank transfers to make it easy to move money in and out. And uh, yeah, just not worry about costs, and then just work with somebody reputable like one of those I mentioned. Um, so as far as um, the students who are in transition to being like recent college grads and sort of like graduate school, um, and they're about to accumulate possibly more debt, how mm -hmm. would right. you um, navigate that? But then also staying strict to um, like a safe, like a practical guide as far as like savings um, versus just easy liquidable like assets that could be like a checking account, but, like not just necessarily zero down or anything like that, or like rely on credit cards or something like that. Like how would you navigate? That? Yeah, that's tough. It's always tough when the resources are so limited. Um, definitely, like if you're thinking of a grad degree, you have exactly. to think about the. How much debt will I put on? Mm -hmm. I, I spoke to a group of doctors at the uh, family practice clinic once, mm -hmm. and the person who set it up said, "You know, a lot of these doctors have two, three hundred thousand dollars of student debt." And, you know, for them, the idea was, "Now you're earning a good salary. Pay down that debt. Don't do what's tempting, which is go buy a big house or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, pay down the debt first, and let your those other spendings go later." But you know, I would try to, you know. Borrow as little as you can up front, and then you know try to have some money like in an emergency fund right. in case you have any unusual expenses. Because I just have a small like credit card, like just for emergency, like yeah. I just have one credit. Yeah. Credit line. Yeah. yeah. It's really small. 
<laughs> yeah, well, and I use a credit card. You know, okay. Dave Ramsey and some of them, they like you not to use credit cards. <laughs> it's true, you know, the people in the business school would tell you it's easier to spend with a credit card. Mm -hmm. But I asked my wife if she would want to go to where you use the envelope system and you pay for cash, and she was like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. But it is, uh, if you pay your credit card off every month, mm -hmm. you know, then you're really using it in a way that works out pretty well. But it is easier to spend then. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I would say really try to have a plan and look to see, you know, how long will it take me to pay back my loans. Maybe there's some loan forgiveness programs you might be able to do mm -hmm. that might have to pay that off. But uh, those are tough decisions. Is there a book that you would suggest that just like has basically a dummy's guide to like retirement and finances? Um, yeah, I don't really have anything in, on my mind that I did that. There used to be a Wall Street Journal guide to finances and investing, but it's been out of print for 15 years. So um, there's a, a guy named Jonathan Clements who's pretty good. He used to be a Wall Street Journal writer, and you can search him. He's got a blog and lots of topics. Uh, yeah, the, you know, the keys are, it's really not that complicated, you know, it's, uh, save, you know, early, you know, save consistently, and then try to use some of those ideas of diversification and, and taking some <coughs> risk in the long term. Uh, but if you're interested, and, you know, we have lots of clients, they kind of find it fun, you know, I have a retiree who calls me up and say, have you heard about this, you know, tech stock, and it's something I've never heard of, but they're getting some newsletters and things like that. But then it's almost more like a hobby. But, you know, investing for what they need to live on in retirement. So, yep. A uh, question about the Roth IRA. I'm just too confused about when I reach the age of retirement and when I'm able yeah. to pull out from it, do I have to pull the money out or am I able to keep it in there or transfer it to something else? Yeah. Or That's one nice thing about the Roth is you never have to take it out. Yeah. If you die, your kids, let's say, inherit it, they have to take it out over their lifetime. But you mm -hmm. get to leave that money in a long time, and usually if people don't need it, it's a nice one to leave it in there. Yeah. What is an IRA, and um, what is the difference in a Roth IRA and a traditional IRA? Yeah. So it, IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. So it's one just that you have. It's not part of a company plan. And a Roth is one that when you put money into it, you don't get to deduct that from your taxes and reduce your taxable income and save you on taxes now. So you don't get a benefit right now, but that money can grow tax-free. And when you retire or need the money, you can take it out tax-free. So it's like, I don't get the benefit here, but I don't ever pay taxes in the future. A traditional IRA or a tax IRA, you might save, you know, if I put $2,000 into the IRA and I might save $400 in taxes now by doing that, but someday when that, and when I'm retired and pulling that money out, I may have to pay taxes on it that $2,000 has turned into 25000 and I've got to pay taxes on the 25000 With that type of IRA, a traditional IRA, a pre-tax IRA, when you turn 70 and a half, the government makes you take out a certain percentage every year. It starts at about 4%, because they, they want to collect that taxes, so they force you to start taking it out, which you may need to live on anyhow, but if you wanted to leave it in, you can't leave it all in because of the it's called a required minimum distribution. Yeah. Aren't there limits on IRAs at certain ages? Well, you, you can only put it in up to your like W-2 income. So you have to have income from wages or salaries to put it in. And then the dollar limit is, uh, this year it's 5,500. It's going up to 6,000 next year. So for, for most people starting out, that's about as much as they can do. Even then, you know, it might not be easy. But if you could do, you know, two thousand, that's better than a lot better than nothing. Or you know, but if you start doing really well, you could do the whole fifty-five hundred or six thousand. Mm -hmm. And then once you turn fifty, you can do an extra thousand uh, to catch up. They call it catch-up contribution. Um, but those are the limits. The limits within a company retirement plan or an organization retirement plan, like a four hundred three b, those are a lot higher. You can do eighteen thousand five hundred into those, and then. And when you're 50, you can do another five, another 6,000. So you can do like, you know, I've got lots of clients that are doing 24,000 into there. Baylor's putting in, you know, 15,000. So they're getting about 40,000 total going in every year into their plan. So we, we, our reports show graphs and it shows, you know, this growth rate like that because of those contributions plus the investment returns. 
if you have um, a company retirement account, um, is it common for people to have that in addition to an IRA that they keep putting money into, or is it? it it's, it's fairly common. There's some rules <coughs> about if you're covered by a company retirement account, you may or may not be able to contribute. Usually you can contribute to a Roth IRA unless your income's over like 120000 or something like that for an individual, like 180000 for a couple. But to do a pre-tax IRA, if you're covered by a company retirement account or an organization retirement account, the limits are lower. So you can only have like thirty, forty thousand 40000 So you can just look that up. If you're not, but usually, for most people, the ease of payroll deductions, it's going in there automatically. I'm not missing it because I never see that money. That's a lot easier way to save than having to write a check or transfer money from your bank, you know, like at the end of the month or something. Yeah. Is there a minimum income you need to open an IRA? No, just you, like if you have, you know, five thousand dollars of income, you could put five thousand dollars into the IRA. Oh. So occasionally some people like they'll have kids working at nineteen years old with five or six thousand and they'll to help their kid out, they'll put that same amount into the, an IRA for them, and that's allowed. So, you know, when you get your W-2 statement at the end of the year, that shows how much you can put in. Yeah. Um, so when it comes time to start saving for college for our future children, uh -huh. um, what accounts do you recommend for that specifically? Okay. Yeah, well, that's another good area um, I didn't cover, so I'm glad you asked. Um, there are several kinds of accounts. The 529 is probably maybe gets the most attention. In those, there's 529 plans in, in all the different states. You can do research. There's a website, savingforcollege.com. And with that money, you put it in. You don't get any tax benefit usually for putting it in, but it grows tax-free and can be used tax-free. Um, there's an education savings account, uh, which is a nice account because you can control it, kind of like a Roth IRA, but you can only put in 2000 a year. So if you want to save a lot, you can't put a whole lot into that. And then a third type that some people use are called custodial accounts. And those are good for setting up for kids, but the income can be taxable. It's like the first thousand of income is non-taxable. The second thousand of income is taxable at the child's tax rate, which is probably zero. So you can have about 2,000 of income a year and then pay no taxes. But then above that, you start paying taxes on it. And so what we'll tell people is if you want to do, you know, 15, 20,000 in that type of account, we can probably avoid taxes. And the nice thing about that account is it can be used for anything. It doesn't have to be used for education. So if the child gets braces at 15, you can pull money out of there. If you want to help them with a car payment, you know, a car purchase could come out of there. Another whole complexity is they all are, affect student financial aid differently. So you might want to think about that too. So that just gets even more complicated, but it's a good thing to research when you time comes. Yeah. You might have already said that, but this. Um, but whenever we take out our retirement money, is that taxable? If it's a pre-tax or traditional account, it is. Okay. And one other thing I didn't mention was like, if the company or their organization is matching or contributing to you, like Baylor puts in the 10.8%, all that money is pre-tax. So when you take it out, you pay taxes on it. It's just like any taxable income, like you have that as a salary in your retirement years. So for a lot of people, you know, they think, well, my tax rate's going to drop way down when I retire. But if you've done a good job saving, maybe you have a million and a half dollars in savings and they force you to take out 4%, you've got 60000 of taxable income from that, then you might have another 30000 of taxable income from Social Security. So your taxable income in retirement may be 90000 and you know, who, whatever you're making in your working years may be not that different. So, yeah. Are there any products that you'd recommend to help protect your identi identity or security if you have like an account with Fidelity because of security leaks or your information accidentally being yeah. leaked out? I, I don't have anything to recommend. I know we work with Schwab and they're all of I think all of them are trying to get more and more careful and, and they're sending out more disclosures and things mm -hmm. to keep it. So I read the disclosures, see if you think you're affected. Um, yeah. One nice thing about most of those accounts is you can't just get the money out. You can't call up and say, I've got this account number, send me the 
send me some money. You have to have signatures and things like that. So they're trying to get more careful. But that's been a big thing for us because some of our people like us are being defrauded where, you know, they'll get a, you get a letter from a title company saying send $50,000 for a, a house down payment. And it'll like look like it's come from your client. And if you don't check with them by telephone, you're on the hook for it if, if you send it out by mistake. So, yeah. Cool. At what stage in your life should you have uh, an investment um, advisor such as you? Uh. Yeah. Um, there are lots of different kinds of advisors. There's like brokers and advisors. Most of the people who are able to make money enough to live on and work with for smaller accounts charge the highest commissions or rates. So for them, you know, if you have $30,000 or $40,000, you may have to pay somebody like one and a half percent to get them to have enough money to make it worth their time, which is it's kind of sad, but that's the way it is, I would say. So it's, in most cases, I would say it's probably $50,000 to $100,000 is, is enough that you could get an advisor who your business is, is profitable, so it's a win-win for both of you. <coughs> Until then, I'd probably try to rely on, like if you've got a company or a, a mm -hmm. organization you work for, try to use their resources, because they're paying like an investment advisor to give advice to the plan members. Go to them, and, and hopefully they'll be a good one, you never know, but somebody you could say, well, here's my whole picture. I've got this in the IRA, and this is how much I've got emergency savings, and you know, help me to think about how I should invest this money. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, some of the smallest investors you know, get the worst deals, like public school teachers are some of the worst ones, where if you get a 403B through a Waco ISD, you may pay a 2% investment cost, which you know, if you pay that every year, it's really going to affect your, your money over time. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah, but, uh, you know, I would always ask them, you know, how do you make your money? Some people are real clear about it. And they say, well, this is how we do it. And others, it's like, well, the insurance company pays me. Or I get money from the mutual fund company for buying those shares. And if, they, if they're not pretty transparent about it, it's a little bit of something to worry about. Because they may have an incentive to put you in this company's mutual fund's shares because it pays them a higher percentage than if they put you in this one. And they don't, you know, it's not actually against the law to do that as long as what they put you in is, is called suitable. And uh, what we have to do as investment advisors is act in the best interest of our clients. So if we know that this is better for the client than this is, we need to recommend that and get in trouble if we recommend something that maybe pays us a higher rate. So. Well, good. I appreciate all the good questions. It's been really helpful. All right. Thank you so much.